So I got interested in philosophy at a very young age, uh, reading Bertrand Russell at first in high school and discovering a natural tendency to ask the basic questions of life. What are we doing here? Does life have meaning? And if so, what is it? Is the world what it appears to be? Or is there something more to it? I didn't think that at the time that anything, ah, excuse me. I didn't think at the time that there was anything one could do with this curiosity in terms of a career. So when I set off to university, my plan was to study architecture. It seemed a sensible combination of creativity and something literally more concrete than philosophy. My first semester at Berkeley, I stumbled on an elective course called Existentialism in Literature and Film. And it very quickly changed the course and the direction of my life. I discovered through both the contents of the course and the charm, inspiring manner, and philosophical approach of its professor, Hubert Dreyfus, that philosophy could indeed be a substantial profession. And even more excitingly for me, that the philosopher didn't necessarily have to limit himself to the world of academia. One could make films and thus not only elaborate explicit philosophical ideas, but also explore, often in a more subtle and nuanced way, their implications within the context of real people behaving in complex worlds, containing moods, emotions, and expressing various perspectives in ways that could never be made explicit in a formal philosophical argument. I proceeded to change my major to philosophy and take every course that Professor Dreyfus offered during the next five years, reading and learning mostly about his take on Martin Heidegger and the existentialist and phenomenological traditions. I also started making films, traveling the world and documenting what I thought were great examples of ways of life that expressed deep things about what it means to be human. My view of the world and our place in it and the creative process were shaped by this study and this work. And 10 years later, having made one feature film and several smaller films, I decided to revisit Professor Dreyfus and pay homage to his influence on me and thousands of other students by making a film not necessarily about him, but about his ideas about how we exist in the world. The resulting film was called Being in the World, and it explored through both interviews with philosophers, mainly Dreyfus and former students turned professors at various illustrious institutions, including Taylor Carman, who hopefully will come join us soon, uh, as well as through real world examples, the notion that being in the world is a unified phenomenon, that when we engage with the world skillfully, the distinction between subject and object disappears, and a rich and meaningful life can emerge. And we explored the possibility that this richness is threatened by technology, which desensitizes us to our world, obviates the need for skill, and stops individuating people, places, and temporal differences. The film worked on many levels and proved to me that yes, one really can use this medium to make something that is both entertaining and accessible, on the one hand, and in this case, quite directly, explores deep philosophical issues. However, after finishing the film, I soon discovered that for me, one essential thing was missing, or at least not sufficiently emphasized, in Dreyfus's story of our place in the world. And that is the role of both apparently inner conscious experience and of deliberate abstract thought. Both essential ingredients, I think, not only to being human in general, but particularly to us creative types. I understood and sympathized with the desire to overturn thousands of years of philosophical tradition, which separates the world neatly into subjects and objects, and which thus overlooks this precognitive way that we exist in the world, always already in it. That said, there's something somewhat counterintuitive and unsatisfying about this view. I do, in fact, spend much of my day, as, as I imagine you do, feeling like a subject, immersed in the world, but also in some way separate from it. I have a constant inner monologue that narrates my experiences in life. I see things uniquely from my own perspective. I have hopes, dreams, private anxieties and pains, and perhaps most mysteriously, as a creative person, I spend a lot of my time daydreaming, fantasizing, trying to think of original ideas, and then how to turn those ideas into actual things. Artifacts that can be shared, experienced, on some level, consciously and thoughtfully by others. When I look around me, I see that this process unfolds constantly and is an essential feature of our world. This beautiful castle that we are in must have started as an idea in somebody's head. The idea was turned into drawings, the drawings used as a model for the actual building. Everywhere we look, we see these byproducts of one segment of human consciousness, imagination, visions of what might be turned into what actually is. How this happens seems to be a fundamental question we need to ask ourselves, and one which I've been studying intensely recently. 
Of course, the relationship between mind and matter has fascinated philosophers for millennia, but I've become particularly interested in the contemporary study of consciousness and how it applies to the creative process. I also had an experience which confirmed for me the importance of consciousness in our universe. And hopefully sharing this won't prejudice those here against my conclusions, but denying its importance would give an incomplete picture. I got a call about three years ago from my friend asking me to help him do research for a new project. He was contemplating a film about Timothy Leary, the Harvard professor turned counterculture icon and proselytizer of the use of psychedelic drugs like LSD. And he asked me to prepare an outline of how I would approach the subject. I did an enormous amount of research, but didn't think my understanding could be complete without going through the LSD experience myself. Therefore, one Sunday morning at age 35, with two close friends, I took LSD for the first time in my life. This experience, which had, was both beautiful and overwhelming, showed me the possibility that not only is consciousness real, it proved firsthand, um, with first-hand evidence, that consciousness may be fund a fundamental building block of our universe. Houston Smith, the great religious studies professor, called psychedelics empirical metaphysics, and I think that's right. That said, I wasn't willing to change my mind about something so profound solely on the basis of an intoxicated state. So I started reading up on the philosophy of consciousness and discovered the works of people like Thomas Nagel and David Chalmers, who confirmed with rigorous philosophical reasoning behind them the possibility that a physicalist explanation of the universe may not, be, not only be incomplete, but theoretically impossible. And that to ignore consciousness is to ignore something essential about what it is about our world. Excuse me. At this point, I should clarify what I mean by consciousness. We hear the term knocked around a lot these days, especially in California where I live. Most of it is at best vague and at worst new age drivel. People talk about conscious capitalism, conscious consumerism, expanding consciousness. When philosophers speak of consciousness, we, if I may, are referring not only to awareness in general, but more specifically to the existence of subjective experience. What is it like to be a thing for the thing itself? For human beings, this includes not only our immediate perceptions, but the entire rich world that makes up our mental life, including our memories, projections, abstractions, our self-awareness, our awareness of the fact that we are aware, etc. I've become interested in how we interact with this conscious plane, in what sense this conscious plane exists, and how we use it to bring something new into the world, and in what sense, if any, artifacts of human creativity might be seen as representations of things that at first only exist in this conscious space. For much of human history, it was assumed that everything had a mind of some kind. Rocks fell to earth because they were disposed to being close to the earth. Water had a desire to stay flat. Heraclitus said, the thinking faculty is common to all. Plato even argued for panpsychism, this idea that mind is everywhere, in The Sophist, in which he wrote that all things participate in the form of being and that it must have a psychic aspect of mind and soul. In the Philebus and the Timaeus, Plato argues for the idea of a world soul or anima mundi. He said, the world is indeed a living being endowed with a soul and intelligence, a single visible living entity containing all other living entities, which by their nature are all related. And um, panpsychism persisted in different forms throughout the world amongst even mo the most serious thinkers like uh, Leibniz and Schopenhauer who said, all ostensible mind can be attributed to matter, but all matter can likewise be attributed to mind. But then in the 20th century, as a materialist scientific view became better and better at explaining and predicting the behavior of things in the universe, the idea of panpsychism became increasingly far-fetched. The pervasive view became that not only are most things not conscious, even what we call consciousness in human beings is, in Dan Dennett's term, nothing but an elaborate trick which evolved out of the growing complexity of the human brain and which could ultimately be reduced to it. Moreover, since consciousness is essentially subjective and science deals with objectivity, nothing serious could be said about it anyway. And the study of consciousness was swept under the rug. As late as 1989, Stuart Sutherland said, quote, the term is impossible to define except in terms that are unintelligible without a grasp of what consciousness means. It is impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it has evolved. Nothing worth reading has ever been written on it. Then, about 25 years ago, people, particularly scientists and philosophers, realized that we just cannot ignore the issue of consciousness much longer. 
It's just too hard to deny not only that consciousness exists, but it is one of the most primordial and defining attributes, at the very least, of being human. As David Chalmers argues, it's the first datum, the one thing that we cannot doubt. I may be able to doubt the existence of the outside world. I can doubt whether you are real. I can doubt whether even you are conscious. But the one thing I cannot deny is that I am conscious. Consciousness is particularly interesting for philosophers as it completely collapses the problem of appearance versus reality. I can wonder whether this podium really is what it appears to me. But when it comes to things like pain, there's no difference between appearance of pain and pain itself. The problem is that no matter how hard I try, it's impossible to objectively describe my pain to you. So we have here something that is both very real and very difficult, if not impossible, to describe using the tools of objective observation so dear to scientists. Moreover, if we do manage to strip away all subjectivity from our analysis of the world, what exactly are we left with? As Edward Fezzer put it, when the natural world is denuded of the qualitative features common sense takes it to have, color, odor, taste, sound, and the like, as we experience them in everyday life, what we are left with is an entirely abstract structure, the sort of thing physics expresses in the language of mathematics. But it's simply incoherent to regard the mind-independent world as nothing but an abstract structure. There must be something which has that structure. Moreover, to deny the existence of the qualitative features themselves, as some eliminative materialists have suggested doing by the way of solving, by brute force, the problem qualia pose, uh, pose for physicalism, I'll explain what qualia are in a minute, uh, would in effect be to cut off the scientific redefinition of nature from any empirical support at all. We would be denying in the name of science the very existence of conscious experience from which scientific inquiry proceeds. These issues, sometimes referred to as the hard problem of consciousness, present us with questions that go beyond the fact that we don't under exactly understand how brains work yet. There is the issue, seemingly intractable, that no matter how well we describe physical processes, again, A, we are missing some essential feature, namely what it is like for the person or entity having the experiences, and B, all the description of behavior and external reality is not logically incompatible with the absence of consciousness. In other words, we can imagine a world just like this one, in which everything behaves just as it does, but no subjectivity exists at all. These two points are illustrated with two fun thought experiments in philosophy. Uh, the first is to imagine Mary, a brilliant neuroscientist of the future. Mary knows everything there is to know about the brain. However, she lives her entire life in a black and white room. She uses black and white monitors and other machines to study John's brain when he looks at the color red. She knows the wavelength of the color, the chemical reactions down to the synapse of what happens when the wavelength hits John's eyes and the information reaches John's brain. She does this for as many years as it takes to understand everything there is to understand about John's brain when he looks at the color red. Then one day, she emerges from the black and white room and she looks at the color red for the first time. It's clear that she has learned something new at this point, a new fact about the world, namely that this is what it's like to see red. And this is what uh, philosophers refer to as these, these raw sensory phenomena are called qualia. This thought experiment is meant to illustrate, again, that no amount of objective analysis can ever come close to making one understand subjective experience. The second thought experiment involves a peculiar type of zombie. The philosophical zombie looks like a human, acts like a human, talks like a human. However, he lacks consciousness. He has no inner experience. The fact that such a zombie is logically conceivable, not even actually conceivable, is seen by many to show that consciousness is separate from any description of behavior. I think we can clearly see this in the case of robots. We can imagine a more and more elaborate robot with perfect memory, cameras as eyes, tactile responsiveness, an ability to interact with us more and more, like a more and more advanced version of Siri on our iPhones. But all of this, we can see clearly, is not inconsistent with the possibility that the robot might not have any inner experience at all. So if the inner experience can't be explained or predicted in terms of outer behavior, where exactly does it come from? Even if we take a strictly Darwinian view of the matter, there's the issue of how something as unique and unusual as subjectivity could emerge from nothing that resembles it. William Kingdon Clifford argued, argued in the 1800s already, we cannot suppose that so enormous a jump from one creature to another 
should have occurred at any point in the process of evolution as the introduction of a fact entirely different and absolutely separate from the physical fact. It's impossible for anyone to point to the particular place in the line of descent where that event can be supposed to have taken place. The only thing that we can come to if we accept the doctrine of evolution at all is that even in the very lowest organism, even in the amoeba which swims about in our blood, there is something or other inconceivably simple to us which is the same nature of our own consciousness. There's a huge amount of literature on the, around this issue and it's impossible for me to get into all the details in this talk. But the bottom line is that when it comes to reducing consciousness to material facts about the world, there's not only the problem of understanding something as complex as the human brain, but there are more fundamental issues about the very logical possibility of ever being able to do so. So philosophers like Chalmers reach the conclusion, which I agree with, that consciousness must be a fundamental feature of our world and that it might be universal not just unique to humans and some animals, but to all things. What we are left with is a new kind of, kind of panpsychism, which leaves Chalmers having to say that everything to some degree might be conscious, even things like thermostats or atoms. The trouble with this conclusion, of course, is that it's highly counterintuitive, almost to the point of absurdity and easy to poke fun at. What does it mean even to say that a thermostat is conscious? In thinking about this, I've wondered if there's a way of accepting that consciousness is an irreducible fundamental attribute of our universe without having to claim that everything somehow has consciousness in it. If we all take a moment to think about this podium, there's a sense in which the podium is part of our conscious experience, but we don't want to claim that the podium itself is conscious. We also want to avoid the idea that consciousness can exist independently of matter, particularly brain matter, which does seem to be an essential ingredient of consciousness. The answer, I think, is to think of consciousness as a fundamental dimension, much like space or time. Fundamental, but inconceivable without the dimensions, so to speak, underneath it. A two-dimensional square is not possible without the lines that delineate its perimeter, but those lines themselves needn't be two-dimensional for the square to be so. Maybe matter has an analogous relationship to consciousness. Chalmers comes close to saying this when he says that consciousness is as fundamental as space, time, or mass, but as far as I know, he doesn't elaborate the idea by thinking of it, about it in this way. To do this, I'd like to look at various ways that we use the concept of the dimensionality and see if they can be applied coherently to consciousness. I believe that thinking about consciousness in this way will help us better to understand the way human beings interact with both mind and matter in general. And my hope is that seeing consciousness in this way will let us see that just as a painter represents a three-dimensional object in two-dimensional space, all of human creativity analogous is the representation or projection of this conscious dimension within the accepted dimensions of space and time. So, First and least controversially, there is the metaphorical way we think of a dimension as a hyperbolic synonym for feature, attribute, aspect, or magnitude. Frequently, the hyperbole is quite literal, as when we say, she's so, she's so two dimensional, meaning that one can see at a glance what she is. This contrasts with three dimensional objects, which have an interior that is hidden from view, view and a back that can only be seen with further examination. In this sense, we can see that the that consciousness is an added dimension in the sense that another conscious entity not only has a physical inside hidden from your view, but also a conscious subjectivity that requires deep, a deeper level of understanding, without which one is missing something essential. As a filmmaker, I'm particularly aware of this issue. If a character we write or depict does not come across as having a rich inner experience, she will come across as cardboardish and unbelievable. Second, there's, this idea, there's an idea of inductive dimensions. And um, this comes from they, they say that dragging a zero-dimensional object in some direction, you obtain a one-dimensional object. By dragging a one-dimensional object in a new direction, one obtains a two-dimensional object. In general, one obtains an n plus one-dimensional object by dragging an n-dimensional object in a new direction, beyond any of the directions available in dimension n. If you drag a three-dimensional object in a new direction, you get that object extended in time. And I'd like to pause here to note that the idea of time as a dimension is relatively new and was introduced first by poets and philosophers before, only, you know, before being accepted later by scientists. Schopenhauer wrote in section 18 of On the Fourfold Roots of the Principle of Sufficient Reason in 1813, the representation of coexistence is impossible in time alone. It depends for its completion upon the representation of space because in mere time all things follow one another and in mere space all things are side by side. It is accordingly only by the combination of time and space that the representation of coexistence arises. The idea of a unified space-time is stated by Edgar Allan Poe in his essay on cosmology titled Eureka, 1848, that space and duration are one. 
In 1895, his novel, The Time Machine, H.G. Wells wrote, quote, there is no difference between time and any of the three dimensions of space except that our consciousness moves along it and that any real body must have extension in four directions. It must have length, breadth, thickness, and duration. Proust, in Swan's Way, describes the village church of his childhood, Cambrai, as a building which occupied, so to speak, four dimensions of space, the name of the fourth being time. It was only after all of this that the idea was elaborated by Hermann Minkowski, who used it to restate the Maxwell equations in four dimensions, showing directly their invariance under the Lorentz transformation. He further reformulated in four dimensions the then recent theory of special relativity of Einstein. From this, he concluded that time and space should be treated equally, and so arose his concept of event events taking place in a unified four-dimensional space-time continuum. Um, in a further development, he gave an alternative formulation by this idea, um, of this idea that did not use the imaginary time coordinates, but represented the four variables x, y, z, and t of space and time in uh, coordinate form in a four-dimensional affine space. He then said in 1908, the views of space and time which I wish to lay before you have sprung from the soil of experimental physics, and therein lies their strength. They are radical. Henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an ind independent reality. Clearly, I'm not a physicist, and it is my humble hope that we can introduce the idea of consciousness as a dimension much the same way that the writers and philosophers did above, and which can later be confirmed or disproved by scientific inquiry into both consciousness and upper level dimensions. For now, what we do know is that science has failed to provide an adequate explanation of consciousness, and that many serious philosophers from Strawson to Penrose to John Searle to Thomas Nagel and Noam Chomsky have all said a revolutionary change in physics might be needed to deal with the problem of consciousness. Um, returning to the idea of inductive dimensions, dragging dimensions in a new direction to get dimension n plus 1, we can ask ourselves as consciousness could be seen as what happens when we drag space-time in a new direction. Could it be that when I perceive a particular situation and imagine the countless possibilities it entails, that this is a form of such a dragging? Could it this be happening when I remember an event nostalgically? When we look at various parts, pairs of objects, and abstract this to the idea of the number 2? When we idealize the world in a work of art, be it in a painting or a photograph, could it be that we are dragging what is real into what is ideal and then back again? And is this why so often a representation of the world is even more beautiful than the world as it actually is? A third way we use the concept of dimension is as a min minimum number of coordinates needed to specify a point within it. A point on a line requires one coordinate, the number five, for example. A point on a square requires two, a cube three, a point in space time four. It seems to me that if a unit of consciousness, if there is such a thing, would require at least a fifth coordinate that specifies and connects, for example, the four dimensional coordinates of that which is being perceived with the entity or uh, having the subjective experience of it. And so note here that even though a line is infinite, a square is vastly larger than the line. So while a point on the square could easily sit on the line that defines its edges, there's an infinite number of points that sit nowhere on that line. That said, the square cannot exist independently of the lines that constitute it. Similarly, a unit of awareness, a qualia, for example, can sit on the line of four-dimensional space-time, as when we perceive something that actually exists. But there is, as expected, a vast mental space that is beyond that line. In other words, it seems intuitively right to me that conscious space-time is infinitely larger than space-time itself and includes not only what exists, but everything we imagine could exist, as well as all ideas, abstractions, hypotheticals, inspirations, but that none of this is possible without the matter that defines its edges. I think, again, that all human creation is a projection or representation of that vast ephemeral space. Um, and then a final point. Um, no, actually I actually have a few more points. We're doing okay on time, right? Okay. Um, an essential attribute of going up a dimension is that the n plus one dimensional entity can move about freely in dimension n and defy the constraints of, what an, entity that, uh, of an entity that exists only in dimension n. A square, for example, can pass through a line at a 45 degree angle, appear as a point, become two points, grow farther and farther apart, shrink down to one point, and then disappear completely. A three-dimensional world that had no time wouldn't be able to make sense of a temporal entity which was here now and then over there. It would appear that the, that the object was in two places at once. 
Consciousness similarly allows us to move about freely in all dimensions underneath it, in the sense that we can think about remote objects, we can remember things that came before and project future events, as well as be aware of things that don't exist at all. My awareness of the moon, for example, doesn't require the time for the light of the moon to reach my eyes. Um, and then I'd like to take a brief moment to um, elaborate this as a philosophical argument that I worked out with my friend and collaborator, Mark Rathal, who's uh, a professional philosopher unlike me. Um, so we're just gonna take four steps and then an inductive uh, move from that. And uh, he suggests that we think of a dimension as a frame of reference. And step one is an entity of type F can only exist within a frame of reference that allows for F type entities. For example, a line can only exist within a frame of reference that involves at least two spatial dimensions. A cube can only exist in a frame of reference that involves at least three spatial dimensions. A melody can only exist in a frame of reference that involves at least th uh, three temporal ecstasies, past, present, and future. Two, an entity of type F can only partially or imperfectly be represented within a frame of reference that does not allow for F type entities. For example, a cube can at best partially or imperfectly be represented within a frame of reference that involves only two spatial dimensions. The partiality or imperfection of the representation is seen in the fact that the cube drawn in two dimensions can only be pre present itself from a single particular perspective, whereas the cube in a three-dimensional space can present itself from any perspective. It can also be seen in the way that the two-dimensional representation of the cube is parasitic on the three-dimensional experience of the cube. That is, that I couldn't recognize the representation as a representation of a cube if I didn't have the experience of seeing a cube in three-dimensional space. Three, within an impoverished representation of an F-type entity, a representation that uses frames of reference that do not allow for the F-type entity to exist as such, certain relationships that exist between pairs of entity, uh, parts of the entity and between the entity and other entities will defy understanding. And then the inductive move, if we encounter entities that seem to be imperfectly or partially represented or that behave in ways that defy understanding, we have some reason to believe that we are lacking the proper frame of reference, the frame of reference that governs the existence of that entity. Five, we do encounter such entities. They pre present themselves as consciousness as having, they present themselves to consciousness as having properties that are imperfectly or partially represented and mysterious if we try and represent them simply within a spatial, spatial temporal frame of reference. Six, therefore, we have reason to believe that there is another frame of reference upon which the existence of those entities depend. From all of this, we conclude, among other things, that what is happening when we human beings create not only art artistic artifacts, but anything at all that originates from an idea or a sense of possibility, be it a building, a sandwich, a film, a great painting, is the representation or projection of a five-dimensional object into four dimensions. Even if I don't convince you of the ontological truth or reality of the existence of consciousness as a dimension, I do hope you will take it as a useful metaphor for thinking about the relationship between mind, matter, and creativity. Thank you. <laughs>